Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm saying that because I'd like to welcome not only our participants in this room, in the World Economic Forum headquarters in Switzerland, but also our online audience as this session, Future of Work, Health and Care is broadcast live. So this warm way to open an online, online event with good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mm -hmm. I learned from Dr. Tedros Adhanom, the Director General of the World Health Organization in his press conferences that I had to cover during the pandemic. By the way, my name is Bianca Rotier. I'm the international correspondent based in Geneva for Global, the largest TV network in Brazil. And it's impossible to talk about our subject today without remembering the pandemic, this COVID health crisis. We all know, at least we have an idea about how hard it was for the healthcare workers to deal with this crisis. Fatigue, stress, burnout, lack of protective equipment and risk of infection, death. But the situation was already very complicated even before that and the pandemic just highlighted the challenges. We are talking about a sector undervalued and underfunded. In high income countries, workers are quitting because of different reasons, mm -hmm. including low payout. As we see, for example, here in Switzerland, workers from low and middle income countries migrate searching better conditions and at the end there is a dangerous global shortage of workers. To better understand the challenges and think about the possible solutions we have here, Ricardo Batista Leite, medical doctor and member of the Portuguese parliament where he sits on the health committee, thanks. Howard Caton, chief executive officer of the International Council of Nurses and Angeli Bagra, Professor of Medicine, Medical Director at Mayo Clinic, Office of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity. So my first question is for the three of you. As per the World Health Organization, there will, will be an estimated uh, shortfall of 10 million healthcare workers worldwide by 2030. How to attract and retain workforce. I would like if you could give a first perspective, each one of you, you can start, Ricardo. Well, thank you, Bianca, and uh, I'd like to greet uh, my colleagues here on the panel also, and uh, everyone watching us here and uh, at home. The truth is uh, we do have those estimates, but in reality we do not know exactly how many healthcare workers we will be needing because there are so many diverse uh, challenges that we will be embracing, but also opportunities such as digitization. And I'll get to that more ahead. Today, due to the standardization uh, of universal practices when it comes to uh, health practice education, we're seeing even in low and middle income countries, high quality healthcare professionals being trained. While this is leading to a situation due to the lack of uh, healthcare professionals across the world um, that richer countries are attracting many of those healthcare workers to their own countries. So we're seeing a transition from the public sector, many to the private sector, because the public sector is unable to pay what people are expecting. And many of those in the private sector and the public sector are leaving the country. So going from domestic to international careers because uh, they have better opportunities elsewhere. So at, in reality... I see a lot of Portuguese here in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, sadly, from my country, we mm. export more nurses than we uh, train in our mm. own countries. I can tell you between 2015 and 2022, we had uh, 13,000 nurses that were trained and got into our nursing association and, uh, and 15,000 actually left the country. So it's actually a negative, we have a deficit. And so that, but, and that's Portugal, uh, which is in the European Union. If you go to other low and middle income countries, you can see the tremendous impact and the risks in terms of the gap and that can be created and enlarged. We also have an issue where we don't have much data when it comes to the specialization of this healthcare workforce. So we talk about doctors, nurses, pharmacists, but in detail, we're missing a lot of the data. But most importantly, you mentioned the pandemic, Bianca, which is of course impossible to ignore. 
the expectations of healthcare workers have changed dramatically. The, the idea of a balanced personal life is put top of the list for many healthcare workers after the pandemic. And we see that in many countries where healthcare workers were treated as heroes, you know, we're, we're barely through the pandemic and uh, people already forgotten the role that healthcare workers played in, in, um, in, the, front, in the front line of, uh, of, this, of the battle against COVID-19. And that leads to a sense of um, sometimes of despair, of lack of acknowledgement. And so I would say that we need to address this challenge by listening to the healthcare workers. We can't, we can't continue doing what we've done until now, which is a top-down approach. From governments telling uh, the healthcare workers what they're going to provide, we need to listen to healthcare workers. What do healthcare workers expect to work within the organization? Is it a balanced personal life? Uh, opportunities in terms of research and lifelong learning and so forth. And digitization is also an opportunity here. Not to, uh, just, just to leave this comment, not to make healthcare less humane, but exactly the opposite. So that nurses, doctors, pharmacists, and other healthcare workers have more time to be with the patient, to have more connection with the patient from a human perspective. And we can leave those repetitive, basic tasks to machines. So in a way, we need to task shift to machines and make sure that humans are left with more time to take care of other humans. I hope we have more time to go <laughs> in detail yeah. to this topic. Howard, your view, and you are representing millions of nurses, so... Mm. Well, firstly, to say, as, as a nurse, to be part of an economic and growth summit, I'm very pleased that our voice is here and is being, is being heard. The 10 million figure, I think it's worse. Before the pandemic, we know that we had a shortage of 6 million nurses worldwide. It was work that we did with the World Health Organization. We have an ageing nursing workforce. That's about another 4 million nurses. Mm -hmm. And the impact of the pandemic, the huge toll, the physical and the mental health toll as as well this covid effect we think could add another two to three million nurses we're seeing the evidence already of people leaving and quitting early so just from a nursing perspective i'm looking at a number that's bigger than 10 10 million 12 12 million 12 13 12, 12 13 um, million and our latest evidence suggests that there isn't any signs yet of that de decreasing um, so what needs to be what needs to be done um, in, in one way, it's quite, sim it's quite simple. We are not investing enough in educating enough nurses. This dynamic of international recruitment of countries who are short because they haven't educated enough nurses, they're looking to the quick fix solution, go to other countries, and they are often six, seven high income countries going to countries that can least afford to lose their nurses. We need to educate more nurses, but we need decent work. Uh, throughout the pandemic, Health workers as heroes who stepped forward, who put their lives on the line, but millions who had to wait for PPE, who had to wait for a vaccine, who had to face abuse and aggression in, in the workplace as, 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 as well. Decent work is something that we need to do. And then leadership. Uh, whilst it's great to have nursing and health professionals' voices as part of this discussion, many organisations, you know, they don't have chief nurses bringing that advice and that expertise. We think a lot of you know, nurses as, as doers, as deliverers of healthcare. Yes, they're great at that. But with nurses, all health professionals, because they know delivery, they know where the problems are. They know where care isn't patient-centered, where it's not safe. They, they've got ideas about how that we can improve and join up care as well. And I think seeing more nursing voices in leadership positions uh, government policy and in health institutions as well, really important. And the final point on this as well, I think I'd say, from all the work that we've done, it's, there isn't a single magic bullet for this. It's not just about educating more. It's not just investing in leadership. It's not just about better retention policies. It's about doing all of those, all of those things. And when you do all of those things, as well as strengthening and improving nursing and health outcomes, I'm in the majority in my profession because I'm one of only 10%, 90% of the nursing profession are women. We can actually go a long way to address long-standing gender inequalities as well by investing in the nursing workforce. I'm sure Angeli knows very well this <laughs> subject. <laughs> Please, your view. Yes. Well, first of all, thanks to my um, co-panelists. I'm just going to build a little bit on, you know, what both of you have already shared before. The fact is we are in a state of deficit 
and we had this prior to the pandemic, and now we pulled back the sheets and it's magnified. And we also know that we cannot recruit from a deficit for an ever increasing demand within healthcare. So fundamentally, I'm just gonna like break it down for, for the future workforce, the two big areas where I feel the emphasis is, whether it's physicians, nurses, allied health administrators, we've got to create a better work experience and the second big pocket I see is value proposition. Because I know, and, and let's talk about the second bucket first, um, since we are on the topic of equity, well-being, resilient systems. You know, I, I think it's time that we prioritize the humane nature of our culture. We've got to infuse the healthcare culture with joy, with focus on humanity. And for that, we need leadership. We need commitment. Um, at Mayo, for example, you know, we have a big group. We, we work on our culture proactively, not just reactively. We want to be ready. So we have a future back approach of how do we want our culture to evolve? Because we know at any given day, we can have strategy, but culture will eat strategy any day if we are not careful about how as leaders, as healthcare uh, providers, as other industries collaborating with healthcare providers, we are building the narrative for uh, the value proposition. We know that this is the field where we have the immense potential to impact communities across the globe, health of communities across the globe. And I think fundamentally that's powerful, having that capability of making a big difference with the lens of equity, well-being, joy, resilient healthcare systems is powerful. The second thing which I said was work experience. Now we know that the workforce of 2030 is going to look very different. We heard this morning 23% of the jobs are going to go away due to um, digitization. So we cannot recruit a future workforce that is not upskilled. Um, I think fundamentally healthcare has relied heavily in the past on a physical pipeline model for healthcare delivery. And at Mayo, we are pushing that to a platform model where there's seamless integration of physical, digital healthcare provision. And what do we need to do for that? We need to get the workforce ready. We need to get them skilled. I think for the incoming students and learners, there's a lot of, um, potential where we skill them in a way that they feel confident and competent with these changing landscapes. But for the workforce that's currently in the, in the industry for 20 years, they are beginning to ask, am I still relevant? Do I still contribute? So there's a lot of burnout setting in from that uh, proportion of the workforce. And I think we need to do a better job, better job than what we are currently doing to upskill them. Um, and certainly, you know, it's been highlighted training, uh, governance, regulation, incentives for integrating our enhanced AI capabilities and training programs uh, will be the way we are going to build the workforce that is more resilient, mm -hmm. that is more ready, um, and, and we can do it collectively with a future back approach. Let's try maybe to learn a bit from Portugal, Ricardo. How did Portugal? deal with the pandemic and how is the situation now? What can we take uh, from Portugal? Well, from a, a healthcare uh, worker's perspective, um, we, we suffered the, main, the, same, the same phenomena as uh, we saw in many countries of the world, where initially there was a huge recruitment of everyone available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the hero speech was put out there. Um, there were promises that uh, healthcare workers would have uh, transformative uh, career after the pandemic was over but that led to disappointment to be honest because after you know a couple of years uh, they went through the hardship those healthcare workers in the front line I went back as a volunteer to the medical uh, to, to my medical hospital in my town and I was working with my colleagues and I saw how they were desperate honestly and, and particularly in the most difficult moments of the pandemic and so I, I think we need to be very cautious of the way we manage expectations when it comes to the health workforce. And the numbers that we just heard here are, are going to be close to impossible to reach if we do not change the way we work. And so I think we need to do many things at the same time, to be honest. One is, of course, more training. We need more healthcare workers, that's a, a given, which means more investment, no doubt, if we want to reach our goals. 
However, we need to also change our health system, which are disease systems, towards being focused on creating value for health, which means focusing on health outcomes. If we do not lower the demand for our health systems, mm -hmm. we can continue pumping in billions of dollars. Our health systems will not be able to respond. We need to lower the demand. The only way that we can have enough resources to treat those that need to be treated is to make sure that those diseases that are preventable are prevented, those diseases that are curable are cured. That way, we will have enough health worker force, uh, a workforce and resources to treat those that actually do inevitably get sick, no matter what we do. And we also need, as I was saying, to focus on digitization, which played a very important role in Portugal, uh, facilitating, for example, as a first line of response, uh, mainly uh, our, our, our hotline, our National Health Service hotline, which is run by nurses, uh, played a very important triage role, making sure that people would not go to hospitals without need, uh, needing so, even some attempts in terms of using uh, artificial intelligence driven tools to do that triage were also tested. And so that shows that there's a, a tremendous way forward, but we need to do it in a way that is responsible, that has a, a, a notion that there are tremendous biases behind a historical gender uh, and other biases when we apply artificial intelligence. That's why uh, in my new role here in Geneva as a, at the end of this month as the new CEO of the International Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence Collaborative, I dare. We are, uh, <laughs> thank you. We will be focusing precisely on responsible uh, AI in the sense that applied to healthcare, in the sense that these technologies need to be developed in a way that are in a way protect citizens from these biases and provide the best health outcomes for the citizen, but for society at large. By doing so, as I said at the beginning, we will be freeing time for compassionate care, mm -hmm. for the human connection. And there's an amazing book called Compassionomics that actually measures the outcomes related to compassion. And patients that are treated in a compassionate, patients that are treated in a compassionate way actually get better health outcomes. And so incorporating that within a digital ecosystem, but also a larger health ecosystem or well-being ecosystem delivers better results. And that then leads to less need for human talent mm -hmm. uh, that can be released in a way for those that will need them. Okay, good point. Howard, yesterday nurses went on a strike, I think in around half of England's hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. So even a country that is very extremely proud of uh, its um, public health system, the NHS, is suffering. How to address this dissatisfaction, um, not only of nurses, but also of doctors, especially young doctors? Go to the root causes. This, uh, what we've seen in the UK, we've seen it around the world, an increase in strikes and disputes by nurses and healthcare workers. The history of this, firstly, is that nurses and health workers around the world feel as though they have been undervalued for years. Their pay, their conditions, um, below often the average for their economy, working in very stretched healthcare systems without the equipment, without the staff mm -hmm. to do the job. And that's taken a huge strain on people. And you imagine going to work every day where you feel professionally compromised. You're not able to give the care to the quality and safety that you have been educated to, which you know is part of your, your professional responsi re responsibility. You step up for the pandemic. You are told that you are heroes, uh, that you are the most valuable asset that the country has. You put your own life on the line, often without the support and protection that, we sh that they should have expected. And then afterwards, when it comes round to a pay, well, all of a sudden, no, 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 we can't afford. We've got a cost of living uh, crisis. Uh, you, you'll, drive infl you'll drive inflation. All of these factors have come together to see uh, this, 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 this anger, um, but also, and, and this is really, I think, important, that the centre of improving the pay, the conditions for nurses around the world, they are making this absolutely a case about patient safety. Mm -hmm. When we do not have enough, edu enough people educated professionally, we know that the risks to patients of greater harm increase. We know around the world that the number of healthcare workers in different countries and different regions is related to mortality. Uh, you can see this across all regions 
as well. So this is a safety, this is a patient safety case. But still, we seem to have this hit this brick wall that when it comes to talking about investment in our healthcare systems, um, we struggle to make the investment in the healthcare workforce. We use, you, we talk about capacity strengthening, we talk about resilience, we talk about increasing coverage and access to healthcare. How are you going to do all of that? You're going to do all of that through healthcare workers. Investment in nursing and healthcare workers is not a cost, it's investment. We need to think about it as a smart human capital investment. I look at these strikes um, and I see that nurses who, where they have gone on strike, a backlog of waiting times, people not being able to access healthcare. I see healthcare systems having to spend millions to bring in agency workers, nurses from overseas, to fill gaps as well. I see absentee levels that run into uh, millions and sometimes billions. We know that trillions has cost, the, the, the pandemic has cost the world. I'm a simple nurse, and, and I'm here in the hallowed environments of the World Economic Forum. But to me, and to nurses, it seems there is an overwhelming economic case, as well as a patient safety, as well as a quality case, uh, for investing in nursing and healthcare workforce. And we have to change that mindset. And if we don't, if we don't, what will the consequences of that be? If there aren't nurses and there aren't healthcare workers, either we see people who suffer terribly in isolation on their own, or frankly, all of us, as, as friends, as family, as mothers, brothers, husbands, wives, we will have to pick up that care burden. It's a dangerous crisis, definitely. Mm. And Angeli, um, you already mentioned that uh, equitable workforce is critical for long-term resilience, right? How to ensure this diversity, this inclusion in the system? Yeah, well, thank you, Bianca. I'm going to build on what, you know, Howard sort of sowed the seeds for. I, you know, fundamentally, equity, inclusion and diversity is, a, is an investment. It is not a cost. It is an investment. And we are morally responsible for this. For this to be successful, I think two fundamental approaches are it needs to be authentic, not tokenism, and, and we need to hold ourselves accountable. And, and two broad categories uh, where I feel we can gain a lot of traction. First is commitment from the top leadership. I think that's very essential for these uh, initiatives to have the appropriate visibility, have the appropriate resourcing, have the appropriate strategic alignment with the rest of the strategy of the organization. Because this is not a, a satellite of a planet sitting somewhere where stuff is happening. Um, so fundamentally, having that leadership commitment from the top to the bottom and all the way around, I think is absolutely necessary uh, for these initiatives to be, uh, to be meaningful and to drive the impact that we want them to. Um, Second thing with leadership commitment is accountability, because empty commitments don't lead to impact or don't lead to change. And one way at Mayo Clinic, for example, we do this is back in the pandemic when, you know, I, I think it became abundantly clear that we cannot rely on iterative, small programs. We need a transformational shift in how we look at equity, inclusion and diversity in healthcare. Um, and so we uh, made a commitment from our board of $100 million uh, towards, um, uh, towards racism and, and really fostering anti-racism. And we have accountability metrics at all leadership levels across our structures to do this. Second, I would say, in addition to leadership um, is um, strategy and organizational structure, where DEI is not the, you know, the right thing to do for the organization, it's absolutely the only thing to do for the organization. In other words, it is really knit into the fabric of the organization, um, and, and it's not a separate business unit. So just to give you an example of um, how that would happen in healthcare, so for example, we have three shields um, at Mayo Clinic. One is the clinical practice shield facing patients, um, the other is research, where we focus on uh, research, transformation and development, and finally education. So an example of how this is knit 
into the patient facing side is our digital and virtual platforms where we will get into the patient's homes no matter where they are. Um, so through our enhanced digital capabilities, we are able to reach patients. So we are increasing access to care and equity to care. Um, on the research side and collaboration again with our other business units such as the Center for Digital Health as well as Mayo Clinic Platform uh, and thanks to improved data capabilities as well as a decentralized cli uh, clinical trials design, we are able to impact outcomes of patients, diverse group of patients whom we were not able to reach earlier. And finally, in education and training, there is a lot of partnership in this work. So we work with um, higher education, with community organizations in building pathway and pipeline programs. So we get that diverse workforce that looks like the patients that we care for. And you know, this is the beginning. We've got to then nurture this workforce, this diverse workforce that we get in. So a lot of policy, structural change, um, supporting um, our workforce. Howard already mentioned that. One example is through ERGs. At Mayo Clinic, we have greater than 35 employee resource groups with over 10,000 members enrolled in these resource groups. So empowering the workforce through a lens of equity, as well as empowering our patients through a lens of equity. That's what it takes. I think we have time to open the floor to one quick question. Who wants to take advantage of this opportunity and ask? OK, ask we have here. You've talked a lot about the challenges facing the healthcare workforce, but I haven't heard much on behavioral health and the real emotional pressures that the healthcare workforce is facing in the US. Upwards of 400 clinicians die by suicide every year. I'd love your thoughts on strategies that we should be thinking more about to address the mental health crisis facing the healthcare workforce. We have one minute for this, <laughs> this answer. We've just uh, reported uh, Recover to Rebuild on the latest evidence, the impact on nursing. We call the mental health impacts mass traumatisation. But there was a really, really big message that came out from nurses who said, we have had enough of being told to be more resilient ourselves. It is our health systems that lack resilience, the lack of staff, the lack of equipment, duh, 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 all of those things as well. That's where the resilience, that's where the resilience needs to, to be. So I think there's, there's an important part of making sure that we don't look as though we're blaming individuals when the health systems. But in terms of individuals, I think there's a whole important piece around the culture that people, you know, this, 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 sometimes the competitive nature of health organisation, the heroic nature, that, that if, you, if you speak out because you're not coping or if you see a, a, a problem within a healthcare system, it can look as though you're being disloyal to the organisation that you work for as well. And the modelling of that behaviour for senior leaders to, to talk about their, their mental health, their ups and their, their, their downs, um, and, and not to, pen, not to penalise people to do that, but to support and encourage that sort of culture, I think would go an awful long way to, to help with those issues. And if I may quickly add, David, that's, uh, I, I think that's the biggest question right now. And uh, to paraphrase, Howard, what you just said, I think we got to break the stigma, but we also got to create more resources. Right now, we are very under-resourced, specifically in the United States and, and across the globe, arguably. And so creating in time you know, point of care resources for our providers. So they aren't waiting weeks and months before they get access. Again, this is another ripe uh, area for uh, virtual tools, for really looking at those integrated models. Final words. No, just uh, building on what, you were, uh, what everyone was saying, really. We, the few countries and health systems that actually have been collecting data have been foc focusing on patient reported outcomes and so forth. What we need, you know, the PROMs, we need the HCROMs, you know, the healthcare workforce uh, outcome measurements, and doing that in a systematic way so that we know in real time what is the sentiment of healthcare workers so that we can act and actually using tools as artificial intelligence to even predict uh, potential sources of tension and of breakdown so we can act preventively so that we're not just reacting to these mental health challenges that health systems are now facing and that have come to light with the pandemic, although they were always there, but not given enough attention. And so hopefully something good can come out of the pandemic, which is that finally we are discussing this important topic. So I think it was a very important question. Thank you. Yeah, 
unfortunately, we arrived at the end of the session, Future of Work, Health and Care, with relevant remarks and takeaways. Uh, the scenario is challenging, but there are ways to address the issues. Thanks, the participants here in the room, our specialists. Thank you very much.